be a philosopher, but be still a man. Well, a woman too. Uh, in other words, um, human nature, rather than the artificial demands of reason, are what should really characterize philosophy, an understanding of human nature. So, whether you um, start with the treaties or start with the inquiry the way um, we have it in uh, Kaufman, the, um, the beginning is the same. He launches out by announcing, in effect, what he's going to do. Lay aside the claims of um, Descartes and Locke for human reason and develop a psychology of belief. Okay, is that clear enough? Um, once you get a handle on that, um, I, I think you can see what, what Hume is doing. Too often, unfortunately, um, people tend to talk about Hume and, to that matter, teach Hume um, as if um, he only wrote the first four sections of the Inquising the Rule of Reason. And uh, forgetting what comes next, section five, which has to do with, with what he calls the skeptical solution to these doubts. You see, he's skeptical about reason. How does he resolve the doubt? By developing a psychology of belief, which shows that belief isn't always voluntary, as Descartes had said as Locke had said. You remember their attitudes. If there is insufficient evidence, withhold belief. The will must not go ahead of the intellect. Uh, to which Hume is in effect responding. The will may not go ahead of the intellect, but you do. But you do. Even if you haven't come up with any proof for the existence of an external world. Notice how you behave in the world around, uh, as if they were thoroughly real. Well, um, all right, that by way of introduction. Now, um, the, um, the development which um, Hume uh, gets into in talking about knowledge and belief, as you might expect against the background of Descartes and Locke, the development has to be introduced by talking about the theory of ideas. And I suggest that here it's particularly important that you watch for where he disagrees with John Locke. If you've given Locke a careful reading, you'll have caught the differences. Um, for that matter, differences um, not only from Locke, but from Berkeley as well. Um, take Locke to begin with. Take Locke to begin with. Um, you notice that um, Locke starts by talking of ideas, simple, and complex. Okay. All right. Um, Hume is quite happy to talk about ideas, both um, simple and complex. The, diff the difference is that whereas Locke takes it that simple ideas are the original input to the consciousness, clear and distinct simple ideas, on the other hand, Hume inserts as the original input not ideas but impressions impressions. Impressions are the original stimuli with force and vivacity. There it is, not clear and distinct, but forceful and vivacious. Force and vivacity. 
so forceful as to be irresistible, so lively as to capture us, forceful and vivacious. Now, his point is simply that an impression that emotive, affective state, as it arises, arouses the consciousness. And as it declines, gives place to an idea. So an idea is the cognitive state that follows an impression that provides you with a copy of the impression. Okay? A copy of the impression. Now, uh, take it for instance, if there's a bright flash of light which dazzles you. Uh, what you experience initially is not a clear and distinct idea of a bright flash of light. What you feel initially is, is the hurt, the blinding force of it. You see. And if all of a sudden I yell at you, you see, the, the initial impact is um, uh, going to be physical uh, rather than, did I wake you up? <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to be physical uh, rather than conceptual, quite plainly. You see. But it's most evident in those physical sensations which are associated with some degree of what? Shock, pain, whatever. But his point is what, um, when we get to Whitehead later on, he calls the primacy of causal efficacy in perception, except that Hume isn't prepared to call it causal efficacy. But it's the primacy of the affective, if you like, of the emotive, rather than the cognitive, in human experience. Yeah. The primacy of the affective, of the emotive. What happens if you're driving along the highway and suddenly something flashes in front of you? You see, it's not clear and distinct idea. Is a reflex action, and the heart beats pretty fast. So he, uh, he is doing in this sense his descriptive psychology. Now the interesting thing is that while the impression leaves you with an idea, that idea as it comes to mind, comes back to mind in uh, memory, remembering the impression, that idea remembered also leaves its own impression <laughs> and that impression leaves its idea so that what you have is this commingling of impressions and ideas the initial sensation the initial feeling giving rise to an idea, which is a copy of it. The impression of which uh, is, is associated, uh, no, the impression of which is um, desire, dislike, something of that sort. You didn't like that. Emotive response. A memory again. Or if you like, imagining something like it also leaves an impression. So you have this whole strain of impressions. And the word sensation, which is associated with the initial impression now rather than the idea, the sensation is, um, yeah, what you mean by a sensation in ordinary parlance. When um, somebody tickles you and you say, hey, that's quite a sensation. You see. Uh, so that the emphasis is on the, the physical, the emotional, 
rather than on the curtain. Well, this is one main difference from John Locke. And Hume uses the word uh, perception to refer to that whole business. Perception. Perceptions are not clear and distinct ideas. Perceptions are just states of consciousness. States of consciousness that begin with impressions and include ideas. Now, um, a second um, departure from Locke is not so much, not so radical a change, but it is, I, I think, um, um, an advance over Locke. He talks about the association of ideas. After all, if um, we combine simple ideas into complex ideas, as we do, then he's going to become interested in the psychological process by which this goes on. How do we gain ideas of substances, ideas of relations, ideas of modes of being, contingent, necessary as the case may be? And he sees uh, that there are three principles of association which are being used. Uh, I might say that at this juncture in history, the beginning of the 18th century, associationist psychology was going pretty great guns. So that what Hume is doing here is in line with the um, associationist psychology where they tried to find principles that associations follow. Well, the three principles of association that, uh, that Hume comes up with Three principles of association are resemblance, contiguity, cause and effect. So we seem to combine ideas to relate ideas into more complex ones when repeated impressions and ideas are like one another. We combine them. And it's in that sort of way that I get my idea of a particular substance. Um, how do I know that this is one of these uh, so-called um, dustless, dry markers? Well, the um, impressions I get of it, both the, um, the appearance and the, the sort of um, repulsive smell. You know, I had to get the repulsive in to get the affective tone. Um, the repulsive smell, you see, that's repeated. Um, the similar, similar thing is repeated. What I remember from last time, I got it again. And that resemblance um, develops the idea of a substance with ongoing identity. So it's as if a mental habit 